but even then, once I knew he was kind of okay and we were kind of getting into the groove of it, I just, I just couldn't shake it. I, the anxiety was every day constant. I was in a constant state of like that fight or flight. Um, and then I became depressed because a, our, our whole life was changing. My son has this thing that he's going to have forever. And now I've got these feelings, uh, that I just, I can't get rid of. I can't seem to exercise it away or listen to calming music and, and, you know, or pray or whatever it was. Hypnosis even. Even I went, I went to a, a hypnosis session. Like it just, it didn't, uh, it didn't work for me. Something had triggered and I needed help to get out of it. That was Jen Kramer. And this is the Bravest Podcast. everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Bravest Podcast. My name is Craig, and I'm your host, and I'm happy you've chosen to join me today. And I promise you this episode will not disappoint. So as a parent, one of the biggest challenges I personally face on a day-to-day basis is how to help my kids recognize, accept, and ultimately overcome the inevitable hardships that they'll encounter. We all want to protect our kids from those difficulties, but it's not possible to help them avoid all challenges. And I'm not even sure it makes sense for us to shelter our kids from the things that are really hard. In fact, and I can say this with a high level of certainty, we want our kids to hit a wall now and again. It helps them grow. It develops respect and gratitude for the world. It keeps them humble. And encountering hardships is really just a part of everyone's path. But hardship without lesson and without the ability to come out stronger on the other side has the potential to be a negative and really drive us on a downward spiral. So the story we're going to uncover today is an emotional one. The cuts are fairly fresh and the challenges are very real. If you're a parent of a child with type 1, this will definitely be an important episode for you. Also, if you or someone you know was recently diagnosed, you'll certainly gain a lot of perspective from my conversation with Stephen and Jen Kramer. Now, Stephen and Jen were blindsided by the whirlwind diagnosis of their five-year-old son, Hayden, who was handed a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes earlier this year. Now, in our time together, we discuss the months leading up to Hayden's diagnosis. We talk about the behavioral changes that Stephen and Jen noticed, as well as Hayden's nonstop trips to the bathroom and his unquenchable thirst. Ultimately, a trip to the doctor confirmed that Hayden had type 1 diabetes, and the Kramer family was propelled into the next chapter of life. Now, emotion pays, plays a major role in any life change, and in our interview, Jen openly shares her personal battle with depression following Hayden's diagnosis. We also talk about how Stephen played a major role in her finally getting professional help that she needed. We discuss the importance of family and community, as well as how critical it is for Stephen and Jen to find the energy and the time to take care of themselves. We wrap up this interview talking about their new venture, which is Greater Than, which is aimed at raising funds to support diabetes research and also creating awareness that we are all much greater than our challenges. Now, let me preface this interview by saying, while I'm definitely a fan of what they're doing and I support them 100%, this is not an advertisement for their company. This conversation was actually prompted by an experience I recently had, which I talk about briefly in the first few minutes of the interview. Now, I knew in basic terms what Jen and and Stephen were going through, Uh, with Hayden, and I believe their insights will be of huge value to other parents out there, and that's why they're on the show today. So this is a conversation about family, it's a conversation about love, and how we can teach our kids to do anything in life that they desire, despite any obstacles they might encounter along the way. All right, guys, this is a great episode. It's definitely an emotional one, but sit back and enjoy my conversation with Stephen and Jen Kramer.
thinking about this episode, um, we've known each other for, for a little bit of time here, and I kind of know your story, but thinking about this episode, it's ironic because just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a person who I went to high school with, actually elementary school all the way through high school, and I saw on her Facebook feed um, that her daughter was in the hospital, and I kind of reached out to her because there was some kind of inkling that it might be type 1. Right. Reached out to her. I just wanted to check in, see how she was doing. Ultimately, her daughter was diagnosed with type 1, completely out of left field. Um, she was clearly upset. She used the word panicking. Um, yeah. so, so this really got me thinking about the family aspect of type 1, where um, it's not just about the person who's diagnosed per se, but it's the entire group of people around that person who cares for them intimately every day. So it got me thinking about this particular episode with you guys because you've lived it, and we're going to dive into it in, in, the, in the podcast, uh, but really looking at how you guys and parents in general are helping their kids through kind of the early challenges associated with type 1 to build their mindset for the future. Um, and I really want to also dig into you guys, your story as well. So before we even kind of get started, I just want to thank both of you, Stephen and Jen, for being here. Um, it means a lot to me personally. I know it's going to mean a lot to any parents who are out there listening, and there are a lot of parents who are out there listening. So thank you guys very much for being on the show today. Thank yeah, you for having us. You. Yeah. Of that course. Is. Of course. So uh, I'm psyched, psyched to, to dig into to, to, uh, Hayden's story, but I want to talk about you guys first. Um, <laughs> you probably, especially over the past six months or so, have been talking a lot about your son and, and and yeah. the things that you're building around that, that diagnosis. And we're going to talk about that, but maybe we can kind of put, put things into perspective and maybe get a little snapshot uh, of your backgrounds. Where, where are you guys from originally? Um, well, we're from Southern California. Um, I grew up in an area around Redlands. Uh, so I haven't gone too far. I've, I've gone away to college, but I've always come back here. Um, Steven and I met out here. Yeah. Um, I'm a massage therapist in town. I have my own office. Um, Steven yeah. is, uh, well now what I do right now is, is just greater than full time. So I used to work in healthcare. Um, I was a QA director for, um, basically DD facilities. So the developmentally disabled. So I was a QA director for, um, 20 facilities here in Redlands and did that for about six or seven years. And, um, but my first love has always been like design and apparel and stuff like that. And so I did design for about 10 years and the, you know, the economy took a dive and decided to go back to college, got another degree in clinical psychology and then, and then ended up in healthcare doing neither. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of weird how like just life has just taken us on this, this path. So yeah. Yeah, and we're going to take the the, uh, the listeners on a kind of a journey through that path because what you guys are, are up to now, and it's interesting, the reason why I asked the question about where you guys came from and your origin story really is because as you're describing right now, which there's certain, certain things that, and we know each other, but I didn't know this part about you, yeah. the psychology part, the design part, the healthcare part clearly is coming full circle in terms of your mindset of what yeah. you're building now. So that's a really interesting part of your story. So, so you guys met, you up and married, and then you have, uh, you have a couple of kids and, and now you guys actually have three, <laughs> you have three kids, right? So, so we're going to talk about Hayden in, in a second, but, uh, you, Hayden is now six, correct? Yes. Yep. And your two other kids, how old are they now? Two and one. Uh, so you've got babies yeah. in the house. Back to back. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. brave, brave parents. Yeah, <laughs> the, the bravest. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you snuck that in there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that adds a whole other meaning, which I never yeah. thought of before. But that's, that's <laughs> awesome. So, so your oldest, as we just kind of I alluded to just a bit ago, Hayden. Um, this earlier this year, you guys received some news that kind of changed the trajectory of your lives forever. And I think that might be an understatement. Um, yeah. Uh, Hayden was diagnosed with type one diabetes. It was just before his sixth birthday. So he was five years old. Would you guys mind sharing kind of the, the chain of events that led up to his diagnosis and maybe kind of go into a little bit of the symptoms for people who might be listening? Yeah, yeah he was, um, you know, he's your typical five-year-old boy, um, very wild, <laughs> playing with bugs, digging in the backyard with dirt, 
I was just starting to get into all the video games and um, just very happy, pretty agreeable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then things just, his, his moods, I think, were the first kind of indicator that something was going on. But we had just moved into a new house. We had just had an, our third baby. So, you know, we were thinking, oh, there's probably some jealousy issues with having, you know, the other kids that we have to take care of and moving to a new house. Um, but he became very, very moody and to like crying if I told him not to do something and then having an outburst a minute later about just having to go to bed and, you know, pushing a chair over things that just weren't normal for him. Um, he, he couldn't concentrate very well. Uh, we would do homework, which they give so much homework now for kindergartners. He would have a, a packet of like 20 pages for the week. And we'd sit down with him. And by the end of it, we were all just pulling our hair out, just like, yeah. Kaden, concentrate. Like, like, let's get this done, you know. And he's just in la-la land. You know, it was like we couldn't get him to focus. And his teacher had mentioned the same thing, that he was kind of zoning out in class. And we, didn't, we had no idea what was going on. Uh, I mean, every night we would come to bed, like after getting all the kids down and me and Steven would have a conversation, like what's going on with him? Like yeah. something, something is changing here. And, you know, we were thinking, was it ADHD? Um, you know, we were just searching the internet, trying to figure out different discipline tactics and, and what are we doing wrong and yeah. how can we get him to, to do what we want him to do? Um, and, you know, we really thought it was kind of part of an us issue. Like maybe we were uh, you know, every child needs to be parented differently. And so we we thought maybe we're taking a different approach, um, one that doesn't really jive well with Hayden. And so um, that's why we would spend so much time just really kind of talking it out and be like, okay, you know, maybe we should try this. And we would literally develop a plan and be like, okay, for the next two weeks, let's try X, Y, and Z. And, and still, it was just the same behavior. <laughs> every single the plan failed miserably. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it wasn't working. <laughs> And it sounds um, like normal. And then, it sounds like a normal parenting episode, yeah. though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially for our, a five-year-old. Uh-huh. Exactly. And so you know, you look up a lot of the behaviors, and it's normal. So you're going, okay, well, maybe this is just this is the phase he's in. But then came, um, you know, the frequent urination, where uh, at night, I mean, he was always kind of hard to put down to bed, where he wanted to get up and five more minutes, five more minutes. Yeah. You know, can I have a drink? Can I have a snack? But then it became drink, 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 drink. Like, I'm, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. And we would hear him getting up and using the restroom. I'm talking 15 times between like 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. when he would fall asleep. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I would get frustrated. I'm a mom, so I'm a little softer. Stephen would be, there's no way he's going <laughs> to the bathroom right now. Like, I'm going to go stand right there and listen. And he'd come back and he'd say, you know, he peed. I mean, <laughs> it was literally like he was hiking across the, the Sahara Desert, just dying of thirst, and he was the camel at the same time. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, it was it was like, this is crazy. This is crazy. But are you thinking, Stephen, at this point, then this is just kind of him trying to get attention because now you have new babies in the house as well? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I mean, dads are tend to be a little bit more strict than, than moms. You know, we, we're very logical-based. We're like, okay, there's a problem, let's solve it you know, you're thirsty, here's your cup, go to bed kind of thing. And so I, I was very much in that mindset. And so, um, you know, I, I thought that maybe it was a little bit of kind of reaching out, trying to get some attention or something like that. But lo and behold, it was something completely different. So what, I mean, was, what was the period of time from when he started to kind of act differently and his behavior changed to this point where you guys are saying, okay, maybe we have to start looking at something different besides what we're doing as parents or the attention component of it? I would say it was a good solid six months yeah. of like wow. things just gradually kind of getting worse and worse. Um, yeah, yeah, I would I would say about six months. And, at, you know, at, you don't really think about it in, in terms of time because it, it when something happens gradually, it's like, oh, well, that becomes your kinda, new norm, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that, that was actually the first time anybody's ever asked us that. And, and to kind of look at that change that he went through mm-hmm. from, from really the behavior all the way to the biological symptoms, um, yeah, was, was roughly about six months, maybe a little bit more. 
So he's having these, these behavioral kind of changes and you guys are trying to figure out what to do with him and how to maybe parent differently, which I, I, I have a high level of respect for you guys just thinking about, okay, maybe we need to change what we're doing. Um, yeah. Not a lot of, and, and I'm a parent and not a lot of people I don't think would, would be that kind of intuitive or kind of turn the mirror upon themselves and say, well, look, maybe it's not the kid. Maybe it's what we have to do. So that, that's a, a, a very unique way of looking at it, I think. So then he starts the, with the water and constantly drinking and, and frequent urination. You finally, I guess, make a decision to get him into a doctor at that point, right? Well, I think like the final straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, was it was happened in one week. It, was, it got really bad, drinking all the time. I woke up in the middle of the night, and he was standing next to my bed, just downing my cup of water, because I always have a cup of water next to my bed, and he was just, just gulping it down. And then he walked over to Stephen's side of the bed, grabbed his water, and just, I mean, and these were big glasses of water, and he drank the whole thing, and I was just like, yeah, this is so strange, you know, and, I, and it didn't even hit me, diabetes, because I didn't know anything about that, so that was not, like, a trigger for me. And there's nobody and then in I, either of your families that have diabetes? No, no, and then, well, okay, I take that back, Hayden's, his, he's from my previous marriage, so his dad um, has an uncle, just an <clears throat> uncle that's type 1, but okay. he was diagnosed much later in life, and I didn't even know that. We learned that later after the diagnosis, but um, I mean, Hayden, I remember the very next day, I picked him up from school. I had to start keeping water bottles, empty water bottles in my car because he could not make it to the bathroom. <laughs> I would pick him up from school, and immediately, I have to go, I have to go, and I'd be like, okay, like, and I'd just throw him an empty water bottle in the back of the car <laughs> and pull over. And so every day I would get home, I'd be having to like empty out these bottles in the front yard. And, um, it was just, it became like comical for a little bit, but I was like, I'm going to get him in. I think he has a bladder infection. So that was what I thought was going on. And I just, I didn't know. So made the appointment, finally got him in. And as you know, it didn't go at all how I thought it was going to. Right. What was, what was your reaction when the, uh, I'm guessing you saw an endocrinologist, or did you see your general practitioner? Uh, we went into his, his general doctor first, um, and then they just did, you know, I was kind of explaining some of the symptoms at the front of the desk, and she said, okay, well, let me go ahead and get a urine sample, and I made a joke. I was just like, oh, well, that won't be a problem, you know? And she she looked at me kind of funny, like, I don't know, I think she knew it was more serious than, than what I thought, because I thought it was just going to be, hey, we get in, get a prescription, bladder infection yeah, and we're out of here. Maybe drink some cranberry juice and we're on our way. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So we did that and then they called us back and the, I think the doctor, because I think they, t they test the urine and it shows the, the sugars already in it and ketones. And so she walks in, I still had no clue and they just came in with the little, um, the pricker, the, <laughs> what do you call that? The blood meter checker for his finger. And she said, we're just going to take a little drop and, and test his blood. And I was looking at it like, I, why? Like, what does this have to do with a bladder infection? And um, Stephen was at work, so it was just yeah. me because we didn't think this was anything serious. And I remember the little meter, it just said, hi, H-I, two words. Like, there was no number. And um, I, I was like, what does that mean? I was like, is there a malfunction? Is it not working? And so the, the assistant, whatever, came in and, and stayed with my son and the doctor uh, took my hand and took me in the hallway. She said, I need to talk to you for a minute. And so shut the door. And I remember she put her hand on my shoulder and she just said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but you know, your life's going to change right now. And your son has type one diabetes. And I mean, literally just, it felt like the floor just fell out from under me. Like everything just became, it's just like in a movie, like everything's kind of spinning. Like I got hot. I was starting to, my hands were trembling. And, um, she was like, I'm going to give you the number. This is where you need to go right now. Like, they're ready for him. And she hands me a water bottle, and she's like, keep him drinking. And I'm like, why? Like, what? I, okay. And so I called I called Stephen at work, and I, I'm, I think I was probably crying. You couldn't even understand me. You were just like. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get her. I mean, it was like I had thought somebody, like, passed away, literally. Like, it was that much of a panic. I was like, calm down. Where are you at? She's like, I'm headed to the hospital right now. You need to come immediately. I was like, are you okay? Yes, it's Hayden. And then it was literally like, okay, I'm there. Just tell me where. And within 10 minutes, I was there. Yeah. So, What was, uh, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm kind of like, um, I don't know. I'm kind of feeling it right now. Um, <laughs> it was intense. 
because I, I can I can just I, I can't imagine I'm thinking of myself as a parent so that's I'm kind of putting myself in in your position as much as possible um, how did you how did you describe this to Hayden yeah I thought, oh yeah that was difficult that I was. Um, I didn't know what to say to him how much to tell him at that moment do you I didn't want to scare him so you know we were leaving the doctor's office and he's kind of like what's going on um, you know and it's like well we're gonna have to go we're going to the doctors right now. They're going to have to do some stuff for you. Um, you have something called type 1 diabetes. I was like, but don't worry. Like, they have medications. Like, we're going to take care of you. And so he was still kind of, like, okay with it at that point, but obviously very nervous. Like, he gets he gets nervous. And um, I was just trying to hold it together because I, I didn't want him to see that I was just a nervous wreck and scared out of my mind. And so I held it in. I just held it in and it had this – bold face of just, okay, we're going to do this. And we're getting, and I was just trembling. My body's like shaking and I'm driving and trying to pay attention. And, it, um, and really at that stage, Hayden's, you know, she had said Hayden's okay with it. And, and really it was okay based off of the fact that he, he had no idea what that was, you know, it was just, he all, had no idea he, what was coming. All he knew is that, okay, mommy took me to the doctor. It seemed like it didn't go so well. Now I got to go see another doctor. And, and that was, pretty much it you know yeah so did he spend any time in the hospital at all our um situation is different from a lot of parents i've talked to and i don't even know that he was actually in what they call dka um they said his blood sugars i mean it couldn't be read on the meter i want to say it was between eight and nine hundred so i know that's high like very high um but they actually sent us to just his well, who's he's now his, his endocrinologist and they watched him in the office for the entire day while explaining everything to us and teaching us carb counting while I'm staring at Hayden, you know, like thinking he's just going to keel over. You know, it was just, um, I almost prefer that we had gone to the hospital because what I hear from other parents is you have, you're kind of immersed more slowly. Like yeah. they teach you and show you, um, I don't know, you have about three days there where they're just, it's a crash course. So we kind of got all of that in one day at his endocrinologist's office. Not not even one day. It was, it was like half a day. Yeah, we were literally with the endo probably four or five hours. And it was literally diagnosis, um, blood draws, insulin, carb counting, ratio within four hours. All of it, all the while trying to cope with the fact that We've just Hayden found out. One diabetes. Yeah. yeah. So you just dealt this diagnosis, and within a, within half a day, all of a sudden you're you're thrown all this information when your mind is not even ready to accept it, probably at this point. No. Yeah. And no. you're 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 given some very challenging news and challenging uh, a challenging outlook, at least for the for the for the near term, as you try to figure this all out, because everybody's body is different. Clearly. Um, what was the support system like after you guys left the endocrinologist's office? Was there something put in place where you guys had, you know, nutritionists, uh, diabetes educators? Um, we talked with the nutritionist at the office. Um, so they kind of, they send you home with this backpack from, I think it's from JDRF yeah. that has uh, a little booklet with carb counting and some dietary stuff. Um, we did have their numbers. We had their phone numbers, actually not the nutritionist, just the office. We well, could and, call. And Dr. Ansel um, gave us her personal cell number. Yes, the endocrinologist gave us her personal cell phone number. We could call her around the clock anytime, and we did <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot. A lot. <laughs> and so much so that at one point, like a week later, she was like, you know, I think this call could have waited till the morning. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but was there anybody who served as kind of like a model or a mentor for you guys? Were there other parents that they linked you up with, or was this just kind of like you guys are figuring it out as you go along yeah, at this point? We were on our own Literally. and, you know, I had posted something on Facebook about it and I had one friend that reached out. I mean, I had several people later that reached out, but in the beginning, um, one had a friend that actually lived pretty close to us in our same city that has a daughter who's a type one diabetic. Um, and she's in high school. I think she's like 13, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And, um, they were actually one of the first people that we connected with and we got her number, called her and she was like, I will come over anytime, day or night. I will show you, you know, Kayla, her daughter has a pump. You know, I will show you this. I will show, and I was like, what's a pump? What's this? And it was just, it was very overwhelming. But I finally had a mom that, like, could kind of 
see what I was going through. And I knew that she had been there. Um, And actually talking about that, I want to shift gears just slightly, but it's definitely along those lines in terms of being a mom. Jen, Mm -hmm. you were very public on your blog on the, on the the greater than website about um, how, how Hayden's diagnosis impacted you personally. Uh, you, you noted that you went through a significant state of depression, uh, following his diagnosis. How did you begin to work through that? Um, yeah, that was the reason why I'm asking this question also is, and I I think you understand why it's like, there's, there's parents out there that, um, and even people who have type one where depression, burnout, anxiety, all of these kind of emotional responses to it are very, very common but not a lot of people actually talk about it. And I think coming from a parent perspective, it's probably the most critical thing we could probably talk about right now. And that was um, pretty much my main reason for talking about that publicly is because I went through this huge thing that I didn't know other parents were going through or other moms. And I wish at that very beginning that I had had somewhere to look that up or someone to talk to who had had the intensity of the feelings that I had because You know, I've had anxiety in my life for a very long time. And this diagnosis kind of was just like a tipping point for me. Like I, uh, I mean, the anxiety was unbearable. My, my hands would tremble. I couldn't sleep. I was, you know, just my mind was consumed, completely consumed with Hayden's diagnosis. You know, how many carbs were in that? Did he just have four grapes or five grapes? What if I messed up one carb? Like, is that going to kill him? Is it, you know, did I give him the right amount of insulin? What if I overdosed it and he's going to go low? Even though I knew that I did it right and I would double check and triple check, like I would sit there and watch him just, you know, what if I gave him too much right now and he's just going to go low and I don't know what to do and and what are we going to do and get the doctor's number, get it right there just in case. And but even then, once I knew he was kind of okay and we were kind of getting into the groove of it, I just I just couldn't shake it. I The anxiety was every day, constant. I was in a constant state of like that fight or flight. Um, and then I became depressed because, A, our, our whole life was changing. My son has this thing that he's going to have forever. And now I've got these feelings uh, that I just I can't get rid of. I can't seem to exercise it away or listen to calming music and, and, you know, or pray or whatever it was. Hypnosis even. Even I went, I went to a a hypnosis session. (laughs) Like it just, it didn't, uh, it didn't work for me. Something had triggered and I needed help to get out of it. And Steven, seeing Jen go through that, um, how did that impact you? Um, it was, you know, it was stressful at first, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just, for me, it was like at the time we had, two kids under two. So our, our baby boy was, he wasn't even one yet. Cozy was still under two, barely learning to walk. So we have these two little ones that we have to watch Hayden's brand new diagnosis. So it's like, it was like we had three newborn babies. Yeah. And it it was literally like, you know, I I need to make sure they're all good. And I mean, I would, I would write out like three by five cards with all the sliding scale, the equation on how to do it. I would educate her parents like, no, you got to make sure you do this. If there's fiber in it, then you got to take the net carbs. And I mean, I was, I was like really trying to like be very logical, methodical, planned out, organized. And then he was planning it out for all of us to take care because I, although I could take care, I just, I don't know, you, you, you helped me and you carried the load for for a good month and a half, I would say. And then when, you know, when she got, you know, when she went into the depression, I was, it was just, I was like, okay, I need to make sure she's okay too, because if we're not okay, then, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to affect the kids. And so it was very, it, it was, it was very much, um, something that was, it was just super stressful. And I was just trying to make sure that everybody was safe. Everybody was safe. They were taken care of and, and to a certain extent, happy, I guess. Now, from what I understand, and this is again from Jen's post, Stephen, you were the one who actually, uh, convinced is probably too strong of a word, but you made the strong recommendation that Jen seek some help ultimately to, uh, to kind of work through this, right? I don't, I don't think convinced is too strong of a word at all. Like I, as much as I knew I needed help, I was, I I needed that push. Um, it was, it was demanded pretty much at that point. 
Um, I, I'm so, always delicate with my words because I wasn't no, there. I, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I, I knew that I needed some help and, um, I went and saw a therapist and that helped a little bit. And I haven't really written about this, but I think it's important to be transparent for, for maybe another mom who's listening or has read my blogs. And I just want to be honest and say that I did, um, I needed some medication just to get over the hump of, um, my anxiety and depression at that time. And, you know, but that's a, that's a personal choice for everyone that they have to make. But for me, I was doing the homework and I was doing everything that I could and it just wasn't quite changing. So, you know, they suggested that and I, I was so desperate at that, that moment. I said, you know what, if, if this will make me feel better and make me a better parent, I can get throughout my day without my hands trembling and, and having a panic attack, then I'm going to try it. And, um, I can honestly say it's changed my life. Like it's, I feel exactly like how I used to feel normal, but without these, this intense, um, just underlying doom that was just yeah. present all the time for me. Sure. It's suffocating. It's, so, you said it was suffocating. That's what you said, Steve. It, it, it's suffocating. And, the, and the, other, the other aspect of it, too, is that, that, you know, when somebody goes into depression or they have anxiety, it, it's, it's the emotions spill over because you, you, don't, you can't really control it that well. And, they're, and, and so, you know, when, when she was going through a depression, it, it, it affected me. It was like there, there was a point in time where, like, I was really concerned for her. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm always really concerned. But when, when you're faced with certain situations, that is heightened. And so it was literally kind of getting to a point where everybody was feeling it. And so that's, that's when it got to, to uh, I guess, a tipping point where I was like, you know, babe, you have to do this. You have to do this for yourself. You have to do this for me. You have to do this for our babies. Like we need you. Like I don't care what anybody says. Moms are the glue of a family, sure. flat out. They are the glue of a family. And if if mom isn't there, then it it doesn't it doesn't. You know, you're still moving forward, but much slower, or you're limping along. And so uh, I could feel that in. I was working full time and I mean, it was just constant. So, um, I needed my glue back yeah. and, and that was the way to get it. So, so Jen, once you started to kind of see some daylight and, and the meds started to work for you and you started to feel more, more yourself again, kind of what was your mindset on the, on the, on the other side of depression? Where did you start to focus your energy again? Um, yeah, it was amazing. Like I, it's kind of like you have like a pain every single day. The medication starts working and you almost don't even realize it's gone. You're like, you wake up one day and I'm like, oh, I just realized I'm not even like anxious. Like I feel fine. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's just funny. It just kind of you wake up and it's gone. And I just wanted to do something positive. And any feelings that I had towards diabetes still, like I just fully threw into wanting to come up with some kind of a way to make a difference and to you know, find a cure for this stupid disease. And, um, we just kind of started brainstorming, like, how can we, how can we do this? Like, what can we, um, what can we do that hasn't really been done in a way yeah. for type one diabetes? Sure. How can we make us stand out and be different and raise money for, for a cure and, you know, for support? We're definitely going to talk about that because I want to, I want to, um, to really dive into what you guys have done with Greater Than, which is the company that you started. Um, uh, so I definitely want to speak a little bit more about that in, in just a few minutes. Um, question, uh, last question. I just want to kind of uh, cool. ask a, a quick question about um, Stephen. Um, how do you look at the world differently now since since Hayden's diagnosis? Um, I will say when Hayden got diagnosed, it was it was a paradigm shift for me. Because most parents, we go through life thinking that, you know, every child is, is, is something that you read about in a textbook. There's always like, and there are, you know, most children go through these different phases of life and whatnot. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's not always like that. It's not like that for everybody and everybody is different. And so, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that 
you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about somebody that's going through something or just even a, a normal person on the street where, you know, you're opening a door for them or something like you have no idea what's going on with that person's life. Like they may have just gotten diagnosed with type one, or they might have a family member that got diagnosed with cancer or MS or you name it. And so it, it really, uh, it took, it took a, um, I guess a little bit of hardness away from me and, and just kind of softened me up a little bit because, um, you know, every, everybody faces something different in life and, you know, it, it comes in so many different forms and not everything is, is a textbook case. You know, it's, it's literally, it's literally the curveball of life and, and it gets thrown at you every single day. And, and we could either choose to have a positive mindset about it, you know, take some compassion, take some patience and I'll be the first person to admit I'm not the most patient person in the world. And I'll tell you what, you know, I always pray like, God, give me patience, give me patience. And he's like, <laughs> okay, I'll give you patience. And it's something that I deal with every day. And so it, you know, to, for me to say that the type one diabetes was a blessing in disguise, it's, it's never a blessing ever being diagnosed with a disease is never a blessing, but the, the, the ramifications of what Hayden went through is it, it literally, it just oozed into everybody's life around him and it caused us to have this different mindset, oh, yes. a positive mindset, a, you know, we're going to take this negativity and we're going to turn it around. And really that's what it comes down to is the choice to, to take action, to change the choice, to believe something different and, and to really move forward with that. And so that's kind of what, how it affected me. That's beautiful. Yeah. There's no doubt that a lot of times cha challenges have the ability to throw us in one of two directions, right? It, it, it throws us into kind of paralysis to a certain extent where, you know, we just kind of throw our hands up and we become victims to it, or it throws us into action and it helps us dig really deep to figure out who we really are as people. Um, and, and, you and you guys, we've all talked about this a number of times in the past. Um, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we want to take that negative or that perceived negative and turn it into a massive positive. Um, uh, so I, I just love the way you articulated that. It's, it's, it's so important. Um, you know, it's also growing up. Like I, I've, I went through that as well. I felt that that diagnosis softened me to a certain extent because I, like you, and maybe it's just a guy thing. I don't know, Steven. Um, <laughs> I definitely uh, was kind of rough around the edges, um, and patients forget about it. If you ask my my family <laughs> now, they say he's the least patient person on the planet. But, um, so we we touched upon something a little earlier, which I want to dive into because I think that any parents who are listening to this, uh, the most important thing for us, and Stephen, you talked about this also, is that if Jen is not well and you're not well. It's no good for anybody, essentially. So let's talk a little bit about self-care. I'm kind of curious to understand um, what you guys do to take care of yourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, Jen, you said you were a massage therapist, but you're on the, the, the <laughs> delivering side of it. Yes. <laughs> um, what do you guys do to take care of yourselves on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I think this is something we, we, we struggle with, it, which I think all parents do, just trying to find the time. But um when we do, you know, luckily we have a great support system. So my, yeah. my parents live very close and are trained to take care of Hayden. And uh, they are more than willing to give us our date nights. Or we actually had a date night and we didn't even go out. We just like, let's just go home and sleep. So <laughs> we, got an, we got a miraculous 10 hours of sleep the other night. And it was the best date night I'd ever had. Just sleep. <laughs> 10 hours of sleep. I don't think I've seen that since college. Yeah, yeah. I, I, me either. It's been a long time. So, um but we have been trying to exercise be more active. Sure. Like we, we go on big, long family walks because exercise is very, very important to me and mm -hmm. our, you know, just staying fit and healthy. And, um, it's been fun getting the whole family involved and the kids like it, it gets us outside. Um, what else do we do? Hiking here and there. A little bit of hiking. Yeah. I mean, mainly it's just, you know, I think any parent in our situation with, two under two and, and, you know, we've got a six year old just diagnosed. It really is hard to just find time to do anything. It's hard to find time to, 
it, it's funny. I was just talking to Jen yesterday. I'm like, babe, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way that we can find some way of sectioning off some time for us to, you know, 30 minutes on a bike. I, I love to cycle. I used to cycle a lot when I was younger. Um, I'd put in 35 miles a day. Um, and you know, I just kind of miss doing that. And so right now to the extent of our, our activity, it's, it, we, you know, we try to do these at least five mile family walks, you know, by the end of those five miles, Hayden's like, Oh gosh, can I please, are we home yet? I'm like, we're getting there. Um, well, and even and- with Hayden, you know, just to address the type one thing, when we, whenever we do stuff like that, we've got, you know, the kids and like, they're still wearing diapers. So we've got their, the diaper bag, the, the packed up the snacks and the drinks. And then we have to pack snacks and drinks for Hayden and, mm-hmm. and treats for Lowe's and, you know, his meter Meter's and insulin if you everything it. takes a lot more planning. Yeah. So, yeah. but I think more, more than anything, um, just having the time for us, just me and her, I think is real important. Yeah. I think that's the, like if we're on the same page and we have that time to just, Hey, let's go, let's go grab a beer and a movie. And literally that hour and a half is so rejuvenating that we get back and we're just like, that was great. Okay. We're ready to go for another week and a half. And we charging your batteries there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I will say that, uh, any parents that are in our position, um, really try to carve out at least 30 minutes a day. Like you should see our calendar. It's, it literally says like family walk and, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're going to put the kids to, you know, nap time here, you know, it, just cause it's just chaotic. I'm guessing that's Jen's creation though, right? Oh, no. He is the, the planner. The He's got all these different computer programs, and we're going to you know put this over here, and this is color-coded, and I'm just like, just tell me what you want. So just tell me what we're doing today. <laughs> I read this whole situation wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm curious to know, um, just to, to – and I just have a few more questions for you guys, and, and I know that you guys have to get back to your kids too. So <laughs> um, – <laughs> So I'm curious to know how you've been talking to Aiden about the concept of kind of, if you have been overcoming the concept of challenges, not letting type one define him in any way. Um, I'm not sure if that's even entered the conversation yet because at six, he's still trying to figure out what a six year old is all about, let alone what type one means to him per per se. But the reason I'm asking is because this kind of definitely leads into the genesis of, of what we're going to dive into next, which is greater than. Right. So have you guys spoken much to him about this concept of kind of obstacles or are there teaching moments in this that, that probably wouldn't have come up unless the, the diagnosis came about? Um, I mean, I know a lot of this is going to come up later in, in his life, but for right now, I mean, I try to show him, I mean, even your, your podcast and, and people like, um, we were in contact with Chris Rudin, who's like, you know, he's powerlifting and he's, he's fit and he's got seven fingers and he's a type one diabetic doing amazing things. You know, I show Hayden that and I'm like, look, this person is overcoming all of this and living mm-hmm. a super healthy, um, successful life. Um, any, any stories where I see people, um, overcoming whatever it is that they have in their life, I show him and I'm like, this, this is not going to hold you back. Like right. it requires more planning. And, you know, you're, you're going to be taking really good care of your body, but it's a good thing. Like you're going to know nutrition. You're going to know what your body needs to, to run that extra mile. Or, you know, if you don't this time, you're going to learn from it so that you can do it the next day, which is really what everybody does in life anyways. It's just an extra step for him. Mm-hmm. So I try to really make sure that he knows you can do anything that you want to do still. You are, you are normal. You are just like every other kid you know, except you have to do this. So you're a little bit different, but in a, in a good way. And he's also kind of taking on the, the responsibility of, um, wanting to show people what, what his Dexcom looks like. And, and, you know, I've got all this, but, but look at me, I'm running, I'm out here running and like, Hey mom, post this picture, put, put the picture of my Dexcom in the picture so they can see that like I'm doing this and I'm, I'm up on a mountain. And oh, he's uh, a budding social media star. That's awesome. I know. <laughs> But he's, he wants to help other kids too. He's, he's yeah. excited about that. I think it's amazing that at six years old, he actually has that, that mindset. And uh, yeah. it's definitely, it stems from you guys. It really does. And everything that you've done to, uh, to keep him healthy and moving forward and in the right mindset, 
And um, so what you guys decided to do after Hayden was diagnosed is, as we talked a little bit about, is trying to turn this potentially negative situation into a massive positive. And Stephen, you brought in your design expertise and you guys started to this company called Greater Than, which uh, anybody who's been listening to the podcast clearly knows that I talk a lot about you guys. And, you know, our relationship is simply because I want to help you guys. And that's as far as it goes, really. Um, it's, it's just remarkable what you guys have done in a very short period of time. It's an apparel company. You guys started with hats, uh, yeah. which you sold out super quick, which is amazing. <laughs> um, now you guys just launched, and I think November 1st, this, this episode will uh, air just after November 1st, but um, you guys got t-shirts in the mix now, hoodies will be in the mix, and then there's a whole other slew of apparel that you guys have in the pipeline, which I'm yeah. not, not going to talk about. If you guys want to talk about it, you can, because I don't want to release any trade secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> but but the reality is that um, uh, you've you've turned this this thing that has impacted your family and you've turned it into a massive positive, not only for you guys but for the entire world. So maybe you could talk to me a little bit about kind of the mindset behind Greater Than, um, where you guys are at now, and where you're hoping to take it in the future. Yeah. Um, so you know, as Jen mentioned earlier, like we we really wanted to channel this. Um, desire to um, really help people and so it's funny we're <clears throat> getting ready for work one morning and, and Jen was like you know she just said the word greater than and I was like greater than she's like that should be the name that should be the name of the company and I was like I literally stopped right then and there I went and grabbed my sketchbook and pencil and I just started sketching out like mm -hmm. logo ideas and stuff and I was like this is it. We've, this is what, this is what we have to do. And so, and then I said, and then for type one, it'll be greater than one. Like yeah. it's perfect. Like we can, it just, it goes right together. And so we, we started just kind of developing who we are as a company and, and really we wanted greater than to be basically a company that inspires people, educates, empowers, um, creates a support system, a community of being greater than whatever struggle you're facing. And, and that, that could be cancer, that could be type 1 diabetes, that could be depression or anxiety. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is I kind of alluded to it earlier, my paradigm shift is that we don't know what people are going through. But, but what we do know is that we have the gift of positivity, we have the gift of community, of strength, that we can, if, if somebody's falling, or if they need help, you know what, I'm going to reach out my hand, we're going to pick you up kind of thing. And so, you know, the, the whole idea of creating this, this lifestyle brand was really, the clothing is cool. It's great. And, and we love our apparel and stuff. And it's, and it's a, a way of voicing, um, kind of this message, but realistically, that apparel is meant to raise money, to find cures, and to provide the support system and education. It's it's really the avenue that allows us to do all the really cool stuff. And and that's kind of what greater than is. That's kind of how it kind of came about. And it you know, it took months and months for us to really kind of develop it and what it looks like and and um you know that's ultimately the foundation of what it was. Like when we went through that diagnosis with Hayden, we didn't feel like we had that support system that we thought should have been there. Um, and you know, we, we don't want other families, whether whatever you're going through to have to kind of go through that struggle. Like there's, there should be no reason for that. And so that's, that's kind of how it was birthed. And with Hayden's being type one, you know, we wanted to do something specifically towards that where right. whatever products we sell, there's always going to be a portion of every product that goes to type one research. So it, this is just the, the way to get there. Yeah. But that's I mean, the, that's the beautiful thing. And you guys just announced, uh, within the past couple of weeks that you are actually donating a portion of the proceeds directly to the Faustman lab, which is up at, up in Massachusetts. Maybe you want mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about what made you decide to choose Dr. Faustman's lab as kind of the recipient of these funds. Um, for me, I just, you know, I was looking into a lot of different places and, and foundations, but I, 
I love the support and I love like the activities and everything that all these other organizations are doing, which I think is very important too. And not to say that we won't ever work with anybody else. We are more than happy to, but for right now we want our money to actually go directly hundred percent towards these um, trials that are happening to find a cure. Like we, I mean, that's the ultimate goal of everything. Is say, let's get a cure for this disease because it is, it's horrible. I mean, people don't really know what we and what you go through every single day to stay alive. Like it is a 24 hour constant monitoring of, of every, every symptom, every food, every carb. And if there was a way to, to be done with that, I mean, it would just be the best thing on the earth. So, you know, our goal is let's get the money to where we think um, a cure is on the horizon. And from everything I've read of hers, I think that she's really, really on to something and they're, they're changing the way that these people's bodies are responding mm -hmm. and it's, it's reversing some of this stuff. Like the, their pancreases are starting to produce insulin. It's really exciting stuff. So I don't know. It just, it got me right there. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. What we're going to do is I'm actually going to put a link in the show notes also to Dr. Faustman's webpage as well. So we can talk about science. We can get pretty deep on science, but clearly the website's going to detail exactly what she's doing, what she's been up to. And if anybody's interested in uh, communicating or donating in any way, my preference is clearly through through greater than uh, because then it'll get, you know, it'll get the message out there. They're uh, much broad, broader as well. But in the meantime, we'll put up Dr. Faustman's information on the website too. She's amazing. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, so just a couple of final questions for you guys. If you encountered a mom or dad uh, of a child who was recently diagnosed with type one or, or any other chronic health condition for that matter, because it kind of goes across the board, what piece of advice would you give them for their child and then also for themselves? Um, I think initially they need to know that there's a learning curve and it's going to be hard in the beginning. And uh, the more that you learn, the easier that it gets. And not to say that it's ever going to be easy because it's not. Right. But you are going to be able to manage it. And there are people that can be your support system. You have to... Sometimes, depending on what that is, you have to go looking for it because it's not always given to you. And we had to go looking for that as well. And, um, you know, the online support is fantastic. You can find people all over the world that are going through what you are. This is how we found you. Um, it's it's uh, an amazing tool. But I think, importantly, it's just to, as a parent, know that your feelings are they're valid. And it's okay to feel what you're feeling. There's a, a whole array of things that are going to come up, whether it's anger, sadness, scared. I mean, it's it, you're going to be all over the place, mm -hmm. and it's okay. And there's other people exactly like you. You're not the only one, so don't feel bad about that. But know that you're gonna you're gonna get better, and um, to just take it day by day and really just learn your craft. You know, <laughs> it, as you know, with, with type one, you just you just have to learn, and some of it's trial and error, and and uh, but you, you eventually kind of get it down. And yeah. then for couples, I think that was your other part of the question. But like how Stephen was saying, you know, you have to you have to be a team. You need to find um, your common common ground. You got to be on the same page with how you're going to deal with things. Yeah, I'd probably say to you that, um, you know, don't forget about yourself. Like, obviously, our the main priority is going to be your child. But um, you, you got to understand that if you're not, if you're not there, you're not present, you, you don't have the tools that you need to succeed, then it's going to be a detriment to your child. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, I think kind of forget that in, in that process and, um, making sure that, that you take care of yourself is, is actually you taking care of your child. And so, um, and I don't know if a lot of people are aware of the fact though, that when, when there's a child that's diagnosed with something major or there's a life change like that, there's a really high percentage of couples that, that actually end up getting divorced mm -hmm. because it, the stress, there's financial burden, uh, not agreeing on, you know, how to, to handle things like it's your, your lack of sleep. I mean, yeah. it's huge. I mean, you want to see your attitude change, <laughs> just try having a type one diabetic and being up all night and then 
being like, Hey honey, here's your coffee. I'm like, get it yourself, you know? Like, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's important to, to really just be on the same page and work as a team. And, and you have to actively work at that because if yeah. you put a hundred percent of your energy into any one thing, the other areas are going to fall apart. Right. So in the beginning, you are going to be majorly focused on your child and all that. And that's, it's needed. It's just needed. But eventually you need to start concentrating on the other areas of your life and putting it back into a more well-balanced uh, yeah. state. I would say focus on the result. There's, there's a hundred different paths to get there. Your path might be right. Her path might be right. His path might be right. But the point of it is, is it's not necessarily what path you choose as long as the result is the same. And the result should be a happy, healthy, rambunctious, <laughs> dreaming for the stars child. And that's, that's what you need to focus on. That's great advice. Thanks, guys. So anyone who's listened to the podcast, uh, they've clearly heard me talk about greater than all the amazing stuff you're up to. We kind of talked a little bit about it here today. But for someone who has never heard of you guys before, never seen anything that you've done, where's the best place for them to get information about you? Jen, you have an awesome blog that talks a lot about parenting and kind of emotional type stuff from a parent's perspective on there as well. Any events that might be coming up in the upcoming months? Where can, where's the best place for them to find you guys? Um, all of our information is on our website, which is www.imgreaterthan.com. Um, we have a section for events. There's my blogs are on there. Um, all of our products, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much all about us. It, it's all on there. That's um, great. I'll make sure I yeah. put the the. Uh, there's links all over the place, but I'm going to make sure <laughs> there's a special link uh, in 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 the uh, the show notes as well. And also, uh, for anybody who's listening, I usually say this in the, uh, the beginning of the show, but uh, by ordering anything on the, the, the I'm Greater Than website, by using the code BRAVEST, you get 10% off uh, right. as well. So uh, that's just a little thank you to my listeners. So I appreciate you guys offering that. Um, so last question. What does it mean to be brave? <laughs> I think for me personally, um, being brave is doing what you have to do and doing it well, even when you're scared. Um, you keep pushing forward and um, just knowing that there's that light at the end of the tunnel, even if you can't see it. You, 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 just, you just have to keep going and, and do what you need to do. And um, it's that trust, the trust that things are going to be okay for me and to not stop. Yeah, I think bravery is, I think it really just comes down to a choice. You know, we, we get faced with life circumstances and we can either choose to cave to it or we can choose to rise above it. And I don't think people understand the power that they have in just making a simple choice to want to change. And the other part about being brave is it's not something that you just do one time. It's something that you wake up and you do every single day. I choose to be brave today. I choose to overcome this today. I choose to have a positive mindset today. And, you know, we're, we're not perfect and we always, you know, there's time where we're going to fail, but it's that choice that really kind of makes the difference. Well, I appreciate what you guys are doing to help everybody be mindful of making that choice every day through what you guys are doing. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, the fact that we've crossed paths and we are starting to do some pretty amazing things together. Yeah. Uh, your story, there's no doubt, is going to be uh, a massive positive for any parents who are out there. Or I think anybody who's dealing with type 1 in general, um, we need to hear these kinds of conversations about yeah. not only the, the, the person who is who has the... Uh, as I call it, the bum pancreas the <laughs> that doesn't listen. Um, but hey. the, the people who are surrounding that person who care deeply about them. And, um, I, I, my hats are off. My hat is off to you guys. You guys are amazing parents. Um, and you're, you're doing things that are, are making a massive dent in this world. Um, and I look forward to kind of watching this all continue to evolve and being a very small part in it. I'm honored to be, uh, to be associated with you guys. So thank you very much. Oh, Thank no problem. You. We're happy to have you. Awesome. All right, guys. We're going to talk soon, all right? Okay. All right. All right, guys. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Stephen and Jen Kramer. 
You definitely need to check out more of their story as well as their company, uh, Greater Than, and all their details will be included on the show notes page for this episode. So head on over to thebravestlife.com forward slash 019 for all that information. And also, if you pick up anything from the Greater Than online store, don't forget to use the code BRAVEST at checkout and you'll get 10% off your entire order. So if you go to www.imgreaterthan.com, pick up some stuff in the store, use the code BRAVEST and you will get 10% off your entire order. As always, I want to thank all of you for joining me for this episode of the podcast. Please be sure to share this episode with someone you love. And you can do that by either sending them to iTunes, our YouTube channel, which also has some new video portions of interviews, or you can simply give them the website, which is thebravestlife.com. And all the details are on there on how to access the entire library of interviews from the very beginning. Okay, guys, thanks again. I'm Craig, and we will catch you next time on The Bravest Podcast. Mm-hmm.